Pre this up, but this actually came out of a discussion um, I had while I was in Melbourne last month at a nuclear medicine conference. And I, I give a Giovanna the right to say, um, just tell me what you want to speak on, me to speak on, I'll speak on anything. I know I close the, the show, whatever you like. And she said patient engagement. And I had just listened to someone speak on astrophysics and the Big Bang. At, the, um, at a nuclear medicine conference, and I went, how about astrophysics, the Big Bang, and patient engagement? And then she, she gave me that topic, to which I will now try to uh, go through for the first time. So a couple of things. Um, I have been on this campus uh, since 1966, when Poly Pavilion opened right next door. Um, my father was faculty at UCLA Med Center, and I started coming here since, um, since Poly Pavilion opened. I looked it up. Um, it opened for that first basketball season. And as um, you know, a kid growing up in the San Fernando Valley or anywhere in LA, um, you learn the wooden pyramid of success. You also were on everything that John Wooden said. And so throughout this presentation, to honor that we're about, oh, I don't know, um, uh, less than a hundred or a thousand yards from Poly Pavilion. Uh, there will be quotes throughout. I won't read them. Uh, you can read them as well. But I think they really go to the essence of what we've talked to today and what we've listened um, about from the patient side, from the physician side to the treating. So take a look at all the quotes as they come in. Um, I do want to thank Giovanna and Lacknets and um, all the sponsors who are still here. And so let's go. And this is my group in Northern California. We do a run uh, as part of the Oakland Running Festival where we get about 100 to 150 runners, walkers, striders to be part of a, a bigger community of 10,000 people in the Oakland, um, in, around the Oakland and the East Bay so that we can be part of the community and share our stories. So this started a little bit from a talk I did earlier this year on patient empowerment. And really, we've spent the day talking about patient empowerment. This is actually theirs. Um, the European Union has an entire site dedicated to patient empowerment. And really, the idea of going from um, doing things to a patient, to doing things with a patient, to really being part of your care. And I wanted to bring this up because um, they actually def defined um, five different points to get to patient empowerment. And we've talked a lot about it. As a matter of fact, you guys just by sitting here have actually done the education part. We are learning about the expertise part. Um, we are getting the support to become equal partners. You, by being here, have really done a lot of this work. But I want to talk about engagement, and, and also much like um, LACNETs, we do believe in education, support, and hope. So hopefully by the end of this, we'll give you a bit of hope. Um, but patients need, and, and the engagement part really caught me. Um, engagement, patients need to be involved in designing more effective health care and being advocates for our care and, and speaking out when things aren't working right in the healthcare system. Um, and that's really what I want to focus the rest of it, but I want to go backwards to um, the Big Bang. Uh, it's an interesting segue, yes, I know. So this is Brian Schmidt. Uh, let's see how many of you people, anyone know who Brian Schmidt is? Excellent, this will be even better. Um, so this is him as a postdoc in astrophysics. Actually, he graduated from Harvard. He got an $8,000 grant as a postdoc um, to do, go do something. He actually was moving to Australia. He got 22 volunteers, uh, most of them, many of them mentors, um, some of them friends from around the world. He begged, borrowed, and did whatever he could to get time to figure out um, Really, his idea was the universe was uh, decelerating. 
the idea that it's a big bang and then sooner or later the bang goes out and actually that's the big bang backwards, but we'll get to there in a second. I won't make you all astrophysicists by the end of this. I can't do it. I'll try, but we'll see. And I really did like John Wooden's quote about surround yourself with people who will argue with you and who are honestly smart. And so here he is in, you know, 1990, this is 95, we're barely getting computers around. So um, that's what he was looking for. It actually ended in, in 2011 with him receiving the Nobel Prize for his work with an $8,000 grant. That happens to be the name of the paper. Uh, he was looking at supernovas and actually figured out that the universe is accelerating. Actually, the universe is getting bigger. But how did he do that? How did he get from having an $8,000 grant and a, bu and a bunch of volunteers to actually getting a Nobel Prize? And what does this have to do with NETS anyway? He got a team to work together. He figured out what their incentives were, what made them tick. If you actually look at that paper, he is author 14. It's his grant, he got the guys together, but he figured out who needed to be author one, who needed to be the last author so they would all volunteer their time and work for it. He figured out what made them tick. They used all the tools we could find. What did we learn today about tools? We need to know what they are so we can advocate for them and we can use them. And he was beg and borrowing tools from a Chilean observatory, borrowing time to measure redshifts of, of um, faraway supernovas, which is actually how we figured this out, um, to whatever it took. And he went where the results took him. Remember, he looked at the universe falling apart. And we'll get to his big slide in a second. But he was thinking when they got everyone for this team that the universe was decelerating and you know, would be the Big Bang backwards. And in fact, what they found out was the data was that things were getting farther away from them. And so they had to rethink what they were doing. And when they figured that out, they wrote a paper, published, I believe, in 98, if I read that correctly, 1998. And then um, a little over 13 years later, they won the Nobel Prize for physics. Pretty amazing. So this is actually it. So this is, so I feel complete in at least giving you, when they were doing this in 1990, you know all the, um, the song uh, for the Big Bang nearly 14 billion years ago if you actually watched the show. Um, but actually in 1990, it was nearly 17 billion years ago. Um, so what they observed was that they thought that actually gravity wins, the universe collapsed, that actually Gnab Gib is Big Bang backwards, so you, that was what they were trying to prove. And what they noticed is that the farther away that you went in time, and the farther, the faintest the supernovas were, the mo more distant ones, if they measured them at two different times, they actually were getting farther away at a rapid acceleration. Their redshift turned out to be even greater. And that one of the other observations that they did inside of here is they said most of the time people who looked up at the skies thought that things were standing still, that things aren't moving. It's only when we started to apply the fact that we needed to look not only at galaxies that were close to us, but things that happened in the past and things that were far away that we could actually figure out that things farther away from us are moving even far farther away from us faster. So they really looked at this idea of People look at things statically and don't think that things are changing and don't think that things are moving, but in fact, they're moving all the time. And I'll, in a second, apply this to NETS as well. But this was their big slide. If you go Google Brian Schmidt and listen to his Nobel lecture, this is slide 83, so I saved you a lot of time. So what's our Big Bang? Well, in 1907, Orbendorfer actually um, was the first one to describe uh, a carcinoid or carcinoid tumor. And so that's really where our expansion started. And really our expansion has started. If you look at this, the yellow line actually is um, tumors, neuroendocrine tumors, and I believe that's incidence. 
and they continue to go up. We are ever expanding, and we're expanding for a couple of reasons. We get better at detection. There are different things that are coming out. Scanning gets better. Um, we're now doing different screenings at different points, but we're finding more. Our universe is expanding. Well, a good other thing is our universe keeps expanding as well. This is actually the number of, of papers that are published in PubMed on the topic of neuroendocrine tumors since 1970. We have a little blip. There are some things that go below the line, but we've been rapidly expanding. So this is, and the other chart in here, this is actually phase two, three trials that have been done on neuroendocrine tumors since 19, I think that's 90. Before 1970, there was one every three years. So I decided not to throw the graph that far. But we are expanding. We are having expansion. One of the things that I noticed, and I couldn't actually get it um, on a graph because I didn't have data going far, away, far enough back, is when I was diagnosed, and I think many of you were diagnosed, we looked at it and said, there's only a few people who treat this disease. We really, there's two specialists, there's three specialists. No one's really working on this. It's static. It's the same three people we see or the five people we see. Um, one of the things I have the opportunity of doing is I actually work um, uh, as an advisor for Nanettes, and I, ran, I run the abstract systems for the, the Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. And it was interesting to me to take a static moment in time, which was last year, and realize that abstracts were submitted by authors from over 200 different institutions. Not three, not five. Our universe is expanding. The number of authors that that represented was over 600. Not 10, not 20, not 100. We have a lot of people who are working on our side. We have a lot of tools that are coming in the toolbox. All right, so this is actually me and Brian Smith because um, his talk was about 40 minutes and my head was exploding the whole time, so I had to go up and have a photo with him. Um, and so what does this have to do with nets? And I'll, I'll wrap this up really close. We tend to think things are standing still, but as those graphs just showed you, they're not. They're moving. But unlike Brian Schmidt, who couldn't figure out why and is still wondering why the universe is ex extremely accelerating, we are the ones who provide our dollars, our volunteerism, our working with other patients. We're the, we're the one our, uh, working with researchers. We're the ones who are providing that expansion. We underestimate our tool set. We don't think there are many things as available to us as they are. We just learned of another one today, but our tools are also increasing. Um, while some things are expensive, other things are not. We think in clinical trials, and I know Pam was going to speak to this earlier, but you know, a phase three clinical trial can cost $100 million or more. Taking a drug to market is a billion dollar proposition. That tends to get us to stop in our tracks. But there are things that we can do. Just being able to um, finance one of the fellows here to go to a conference will give you a lifelong person who is going to contribute to um, net tumors and net tumor research. And so there are things that we can do that are 5,000, 10,000. I don't know if 8,000 to get a Nobel Prize is the right give and get at this moment, but, but there are things that we can do that are fairly inexpensive that can go a long way. Much can be done when you understand what everyone's needs are. We look at this, um, I, I look at the patient groups and Johannes and I work in a lot of nuclear medicine, and I'm thinking about when gallium-68 needed to be approved, and 70 patients came to a conference and spoke their mind in front of the FDA, and the FDA said, bring us an application immediately. When we understand what people's needs are and how to interact with them at that right moment, we can do amazing things. Whether it's drug approvals, or as the change.org and what um, Giovanna's having signed here, um, whether to try to get insurance coverage for different types of treatment. Go where the data leads you. Um, the data doesn't always lead you where you think it would be. NetRF, we talk about um, DACs and, and different types of things that we discovered that didn't really 
go where we thought they would go, except they went somewhere new, and now they're being used in different ways that we could have never imagined when we, um, we funded that research. And so you need to also go where your data is taking you, and that's working with your physicians um, as well to figure out where that data takes you. Respect uncertainty. Um, interestingly enough, I read all the interviews that were done by all the no the, his entire team at the Nobel um, Award Ceremony, and one of the things they said to a T is that people don't understand uncertainty and that nothing is uncertain. And I think as patients, when I read the forums, we want the certain answer. We want a definitive path forward. Uncertainty is out there. You have to respect it. You have to know that things are going to change on you and that there is some uncertainty this. Um, change is a constant. Agility is key, which kind of goes to the back point as well, to the last point. So really, we are, and how I'm going to wrap this up is our friends and family can play a significant role in how we engage with our healthcare community, with other patients, and we really are the drivers of the expansion of our own healthcare. And we often get stopped. This is my last quote from John Wooden. That's his statue down um, on Bruin Walk. Um, really don't let what you can't do interfere with what you can do. And with that, I thank you for your time. First, I want to thank all of you who are here. Um, thank you for coming. This, patient is, this pa conference is for patients and their families, and you're the reason we do this every year. Um, please come out to our monthly meetings. But thank you so much for making this a very special day.